Hello, and welcome to this evening's panel discussion, Economics and Modality in Times of Crisis. I am Lars Springfeld, and I'm going to moderate this session. I'm an undergraduate student at University of Bayreuth in Germany, and part of the organizing team of this year's Summer Academy for Pluralist Economics. So let me give you a brief background of the Summer Academy for our external listeners. Since 2017, the Summer Academy for Pluralist Economics takes place each year as a one-week event in Neudietendorf, close to Erfurt in central Germany. This year, we are hosting the Summer Academy as an online event for the first time, which gave us the opportunity to become even more international. Thus, we are very happy to have 140 registered participants from over 40, 40 countries from all over the world. Besides 12 workshops on different aspects of pluralist economics, there is our evening lecture series, which is publicly accessible. Also, this panel debate is part of our evening lecture series. So here you can see the schedule of our summer academy and uh, this evening's public lecture. So how does today's session on economics and morality in times of crisis fit into the overall theme of the Summer Academy, which is a critical engagement with development, societal transformation, as well as decolonization in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, I would argue that the current pandemic and its consequences make it increasingly clear that we are in urgent need for alternatives to the neoliberalism, which became the dominant paradigm of mainstream economics in the 1980s. And as can be seen in social movements like Fridays for Future and Black Lives Matter, these alternatives to a deep, deep politized neoliberal globalization mainly revolve around issues of ecological, social, um, and economic justice. This already implies question of morality, how should a just society, a just economic system look like? Secondly, we want to question the Western and Eurocentric assumption of secular, secularism. That is, that there exists a secular public sphere which can be analyzed through positive economics in the private sphere of religious belief and personal, personal faith. Thus, if we want to decolonize economics, we should ask ourselves what role moral and religious values, as well as institutions, do or should play in a transition towards a more just and more sustainable future for the whole of humanity instead the privileged few. In this sense, I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. But before we start, let me quickly mention an organizational point. Please use the Q&A to pose your questions already during the discussion. And if possible, we will give you the opportunity to read out the question yourself. But keep in mind that this, um, this panel discussion is um, being broadcast on YouTube. So if you want to stay anonymous, it will, I will read out your question from the Q&A. So finally, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. First, there is Athena Peralta. She is uh, from the Philippines and serves as a program executive for economic and ecological justice at the World Council of Churches. She has a background in economics with a postgraduate diploma in feminist development economics from the Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University in The Hague, the Netherlands. Previously, she was a senior economic development specialist at the, at the National Economic and Development Authority of the Philippines. We are glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lars. Uh, and thank you so much uh, to the um, online Summer Academy for uh, Pluralist uh, Economics uh, for this uh, invitation and this opportunity. It's, it's really wonderful. Yes, it's a pleasure to have you here. Then there's Professor Aza Karam. She is Secretary General of Religions for Peace International and Professor of Religion and Development at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Professor Karam has served in different positions in the United Nations since 2004, as well as other intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations since the early 1990s. 
As an Islamic theologian and expert on the Middle East, she lectured in various academic institutions in Europe, North America, Africa, and the Middle East. We are especially thankful for having you with us tonight. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you. I am not an Islamic theologian, but I will speak to some aspects of Islamic theology and praxis. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that uh, clarification. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, there's Professor Dr. Celia Graupe. She is Professor of Economics and Philosophy, as well as um, Head of the Institute of Economics at, um, and Vice President of the Cosanos Hochschule, an independent state-recognized university in Germany, which she co-founded in 2014. As a philosopher, she studied and did research on Asian and particularly Japanese philosophy. We are glad to have you on the panel. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me and thanks for everyone to listening. And I, I just wrote to Lars, uh, we have some um, very heavy rains at the moment and some thunderstorms. So it might be that I have to look at my house um, in the meantime. Um, yeah, but I'm looking forward and especially feeling um, the change that's going on in, 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 in the sphere of our climate um, so directly. I think it's really nice to have this talk and I'm trying to I will try to bring in the Buddhist perspective from, from East Asia. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'd like to start our discussion with a simple but at the same time very profound question which is how can we conceive of the human being? And our panelists have already prepared a short introductory statement on this question. So I'm just gonna hand over to Athena Peralta. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Um, I imagine um, that, um, that this question, this question of uh, how we conceive human beings might be raising a few eyebrows here and there. I mean, how was this question even relevant um, for exploring economics? and our current um, socioeconomic, uh, ecological predicament. And I think um, we will be discussing this further in a bit uh, uh, about the fact that um, a particular ideological understanding of what it is to be human is, is at the base of uh, prevailing economic thinking um, and prevailing economic paradigms um, that, are, um, that have forged and uh, continue to forge economic policy and practice with deep repercussions uh, for people and planet. Uh, but um, to revert back to the original question, um, I will um, begin and locate my contribution by saying that I'm not a trained theologian. Um, uh, and and as, um, as mentioned in the, in the introduction, my background is in economics. And uh, for some, it will be strange uh, that um, someone like me uh, we'll be working um, with the World Council of Churches, which is a faith-based um, uh, international organization and fellowship of um, over 350 uh, Christian churches all over the world. In any case, I am sharing here um, a Christian perspective. So a good place um, uh, to start um, is um, uh, Genesis. <laughs> um, uh, in the Christian view, all creation is deemed essentially good. And human beings um, in particular um, um, are made in the image and likeness of God. So, you know, we are touched by the sacred, um, so to speak. We have inherent dignity. Um, and following from this, we also have um, inherent rights. And this is probably the bedrock of um, Christian ethics. Uh, the implications are that um, human beings possess a sense of right and wrong, just and unjust, fair and unfair. And therefore, we have a responsibility to act and to live righteous lives. And it has often been said that it is precisely this consciousness uh, or knowledge of good and evil so famously depicted in this biblical you know, Garden of Eden story. Um, it's often been said that it's this capacity for moral reflection and action um, that makes us different and some might argue debatably even superior to other uh, creatures. 
So let me relate this a bit more to the theme of our talk. There is, um, um, there is this striking text in the Bible, um, and I quote um, from uh, both the uh, Old Testament and in the New Testament, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God and, and you know, forgive the not so gender friendly language here. Uh, so yes, human civilization has been striving for millennia to secure uh, basic needs of food, uh, water, shelter, and, and clothing. You know what the um, English um, economist uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, called the economic problem. Uh, so we have developed um, agriculture, we have built economic structures and systems um, specifically to address um, this um, purpose. Uh, but at the same time, we are not you know, um, simply one-dimensional uh, material uh, beings focused on mere survival. We are also ethical, moral, and uh, spiritual um, uh, beings. And so the rational pursuit, the so-called rational pursuit of basic needs um, cannot but also be informed and formed by our values. Uh, understanding that many economic decisions, even day-to-day -day ones, uh, such as whether or not, for instance, to buy organic eggs in the grocery store, um, you know, involve um, some moral evaluation. The, the saying that man does not live by bread alone also implies that we human beings uh, search for meaning uh, or, or happiness in life. We call it life and fullness in the Christian tradition. And this pursuit goes well beyond um, the satisfaction of basic needs and even the accumulation of money. Perhaps another important recognition that emerges from the, the idea that we are created in God's image um, is that um, uh, all human beings are born equal. So all people, regardless of race, regardless of gender or socioeconomic status are valuable, are worthy and deserving of God's love and mercy. And therefore, this notion of equity or equality among human beings is a value that Christians um, will tend to feel uh, strongly about. Um, in the Christian perspective, the full expression of the human self is to be found in community. The concept of community, of relationships, is incredibly vital. Uh, God's intention is for human beings to live um, not just in fellowship with God, um, but also in fellowship with one another and in harmony with God's creation. And God created uh, a community of interdependent relationships where humans um, have the loving responsibility to care for one another and for the earth uh, household, so to speak. And, and interestingly, the Greek term for household is um, oikos, and, it, and um, as it happens, it is also the etymological root of the words economy uh, and uh, ecology. So caring for our neighbors um, is at the very core of, so certainly it's not exclusive to, um, the Christian message it is nothing less than a commandment, you know? So um, again, um, in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you. And it is this um, that characterizes um, uh, discipleship. And this call to love your neighbor um, and to care for creation uh, cannot but have uh, profound implications for economic behavior and for economic relations. So the economy is, of course, a realm of relationships. 
uh, there's obviously the relationship between consumer and producer, um, I don't know, landlord and uh, a VC, for instance, but also the relationship between human beings and other creatures, land, water, forest. And the Bible is replete with texts and parables that cry out for just economic relation. In real life, modern scenarios, um, this uh, means, for instance, that uh, it is the responsibility of economy, uh, sorry, companies to pay their workers just wages so that um, they can live um, in dignity. Um, it is um, the responsibility of producers um, to um, produce um, you know, healthful uh, uh, goods you know, that enhance um, the well-being of consumers. Um, it is, for instance, the responsibility of agri-industrial uh, plantations, of mining corporations, um, uh, to allow for land to recover and, for instance, to protect water resources from contamination and so on and so on. Um, and indeed, um, I would say to close uh, this part, at least, that um, the greatest uh, challenges of our generation, um, that would be the scandalous, scandalous levels of inequality that we witness today, and this growing climate emergency stem from the very brokenness. Of, of these relationships. So uh, for now, I will, I will um, uh, end here. Yes, um, thank you very much. And I think you mentioned some uh, very, very important uh, points. I mean, uh, first of all, um, that um, humans, the idea of dignity, um, equality, um, also the responsibility that comes with um, being God's creation, um, the capacity of knowing good and evil, moral reflection. Um, and of course, um, that man should not live on bread alone. I think this is a very um, important statement. Um, so which means that actually life is more than securing um, basic needs. And then I quite like your analogy with the oikos and the economy and um, yes, and also drawing the relation to care, caring, caring for others um, and pointing out that the economy is basically about relationships with other human beings and nature. Um, so thank you very much for this um, statement and I'm going to hand over to Aza Karam. Thank you very much indeed, Lars, and thank you to Athena for uh, an excellent presentation as well, from which, to be honest with you, I almost feel like saying, well, that's done. I think you've covered the Muslim part too, so we can maybe go to another religious tradition and look at how that perceives an answer to the human being or how it uh, assesses. Truly, almost every single thing that Athena has laid out as within the Bible is absolutely and totally applicable and the exact understanding within the Muslim tradition as well. Um, Perhaps an interesting point to note uh, that few people seem to understand about Islam is that the holy, the holy book of Islam is the Quran, the Holy Quran, which Muslims believe was is the, the word of God, as uh, narrated through his uh, prophet, Sayyidina Muhammad, who in turn cannot be seen in isolation. He did not emerge out of the blue, but in fact, he's supposed to be coming after a long litany of messengers and prophets from Abraham, all the way, including uh, Moses, Jesus, and then comes Muhammad. So there's, there's a, the element of intersectionality and continuity within the traditional Muslim understanding of everything, the Muslim worldview in general, of course, one is generalizing, but in general, if you, if you are a Muslim, you are, you have to believe in the fact that there were many prophets and messengers and that some of them are actually not even mentioned in the Holy Quran. So they, it says, you know, there are so many more than you will be aware that you know the names of. So this has opened the door for some theologians, not me, I am not a theologian, but this has opened the door for some theologians to also say, you know, it, it could well be that some of these other messengers and prophets and so on are also the ones that we so today may be seeing more in the context of Hinduism or Buddhism or Jainism or any of these other traditions, because the context here is that God continues to, to try to send the message of uh, and the knowledge um, in so many different ways to all his creation, all his, his creatures. 
So that element of intersectionality is very, very strong. That element of continuity is very, very integral to the understanding of what it is to be a Muslim and who a Muslim is. A Muslim is a product of many ways of thinking, is part of a fabric of existence. This element is also very much uh, peppered throughout in the, in the verses of the Quran and in the surahs in the Quran. One of these examples of the, how you cannot distinguish man understood as humans and actually referred to very often in the, in the context of the Quran as, O oh, ye humans, um, but the, 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 that, that it is almost impossible to distinguish between the creation of man, how we were created, Adam, and the creation of the cosmos or the universe that we live in and of therefore all living things. So there is, you cannot think of man as existing separate from, or the welfare of humans as being separate from the everything around them, including other humans, obviously, but even deeper than that, including the cosmos itself, the sun, the moon, the various planets, uh, the trees, the, the, the water, the everything is supposed to be an in, part of the creation of the divine and therefore very much inherent to who and what a human is and should be. This is extremely basic actually to the average Muslim that we don't even think about it. We understand that we are intimately interconnected. Over time, as with many other uh, ideologies and isms and traditions, I think human beings are expert at setting what distinguishes them as opposed to what unites them. I think we're extremely capable of setting distinctions and borders and boundaries. Um, when in fact, I believe that all major faith traditions, all faith traditions speak to that inherent oneness, not only of mankind or humanity, but the inherent oneness with this universe that we occupy and that which lies beyond it. So what we see and what we don't see and may yet be unaware, we are one with that too, right? So. From there, the concept of supposedly the very first verses that the Prophet Muhammad heard uh, from the Archangel Gabriel were to read. And the Prophet was illiterate. So the understanding of read what, I don't, I, what? Um, but the, the link between reading, i.e. knowledge, knowledge, you must gain knowledge, you must be learned. Reading is then intimately connected with creation. Uh, read in the name of, of the Lord who created you from nothing, from a little thing, he created you. Um, and then it is part and part of this universe around you. So be learned, that the commandment almost is to be learned about how you as a human being are a, a creation of the divine, but as as well, you must be learned about that. So don't take for granted, don't just let, you must be learned about that, read, and then understood in the context of this creation around you. This entire creation around you is part of you and is part of the creation that, that is uh, made by the divine. So, so there's an, an immediate intersection from the very first words that uh, God supposedly sent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu There's an immediate link to be made between creation of all of this entire universe the presence of a human being and, and the creation of this human being and knowledge, the seeking of knowledge. Now, knowledge here also is explained in so many other parts of the Quran to be the capacity, and, and I believe Athena referred to it in, in much better wording than this, but the capacity to be discerning, the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, between shades of color, between purpose and meaning, between obligations and responsibility, the, capacity to be discerning is what has uh, what what human beings have and indeed uh, also as Peralta mentioned there is a sort of some would argue therefore a superiority to everything around them in the universe but it's not so much a superiority as it is a responsibility towards that which is life all that which is life around us and the, and the, and that 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 sense of discernment applies, the sense of learning, knowledge, discernment is about taking responsibility in order for us to be proper um, stewards, 
the term in, in, in Arabic is khilafa. We are supposed to be, as human beings, we are supposed to be the, 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 khal, the khalifas of, of God. We are supposed to be the stewards that God has given this capacity of discernment, of thinking, of, of brain, to because not because we can be so wonderful and mighty about ourselves and not to become arrogant, which unfortunately plenty do, but it is really because this is how you become responsible, this is how you take responsibility for the for the cosmos and not just for yourself, but for yourself as part of a cosmos of living entities. And so the notion then that human a human being is part of the earth that that she, he or she treads. The, 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 from, and it's actually one of the most interesting things about reading the Quran as a lay person is that every verse can be, every chapter can be enormously complicated because it doesn't just, okay, it's supposed to be the story of Jesus or the story of Maryam, Mary, and the chapter is about that. But when you read it, it's an, it's a, it's a, it goes into earth and the universe and the story of uh, 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 Lot and yet other prophets and, and it's how how we uh, how we behave our nefs our very uh, spirit and soul, and so you actually read a chapter and you realize you've covered practically everything in this chapter that is, and you have to then struggle to understand well, where's the connection because if you're thinking linear, and if you're thinking uh, just in two categories as per enlightenment thinking, unfortunately that we are yet burdened with, you won't be able to understand the complexity of what is being narrated and what is being narrated the stories that are being narrated are so intertwined that you'll end up getting seriously confused and somewhat irritated that we haven't just focused on the one thing in order to understand what this you know if, if it was if it was Jesus what precisely was Jesus supposed to be doing or saying or whatever but you've gone from Jesus to Mary to Abraham to Lot to uh, the, the the earth and the sky and how heaven and what heaven is and how that is. and you realize good lord this is very confusing if you approach it with that narrow-mindedness that many of us have because our enlightenment thinking has schooled us to try to see things in categories. But if you approach it with that categorization attitude, you will not, you will lose the fundamental beauty actually of all texts, of all religious holy books. And that fundamental beauty resides in the fact that, that the creation of us as human beings is intimately interconnected with the creation of the cosmos and the world and the planet as we live in, that the, the leaves of a tree, the drop of water from any uh, place, whether it's a stream or the ocean or the rain, that all of this is quintessentially not only part of who we are and what we are, but it is fundamentally part of what we are meant to do. What we are meant to do is intimately connected with this uh, task of being the stewards of the divine in this space. This is actually this kind of extraordinarily holistic and complex understanding of being responsibility uh, is intimately connected to what it means to be a Muslim and how it is to be a person of faith. And in many cases throughout the Quran, the word for al-Muslimin or al-Muslimun, the Muslims, is changed alternately with al-mu'minin or al-mu'minun, the believers. So Muslims, as we today understand that you have to be saying this, 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 and you have to do this, this, and that makes you a Muslim. In the Quran, according to the Quran, a Muslim is a believer, first and foremost, a believer, right? And it was later when the Prophet Muhammad came and then he died, this is how you have to become a Muslim. That was categorized after. But in the verses of the Quran, to be a believer is to be a Muslim. Now think about and ponder that for a second, yes? Um, there is also the issue of what is the implication then of all this? If there's such an interconnectedness, such an intersectionality between the, be the existence as humans, the spirit and the soul we carry within that is supposed to be integral to the very universe we live in, again, to the trees, the earth, the sky, the, the cosmos beyond that we have yet to learn. Um, if, if this is the case, if there's such an intersectionality, indeed complementarity of responsibilities and obligations as humans, because people sometimes wonder, what am I here for? You're here to save this earth. You're here to steward this space for one another. That it, it, it kind of is as simple and as complicated as that, yes? Um, but if we then think with that lens, what does that imply? Um, again, as Athena was mentioning so be beautifully, what does it imply for the economics 
the world of economics and finance as we know it. Well, first of all, there wasn't, there wasn't money at that point in necessarily in terms of coins as we know them and, and, and banknotes and what have you. There was very much across the world, the, a barter economy context. Yes, you, you give me this much, which I need, and I will give in turn this other much, which you need. And so that, again, this context of I am dependent on you. And if I end up hurting you, I am hurting me. So if I cheat you, I'm actually cheating me, right? That interdependence and complementarity becomes absolutely critical for our fundamental understanding of what it is that economics is supposed to be. We think economics in terms of, as, as, as Athena also said, so there's, there's Adam Smith all the way to um, Maynard Keynes and to Stiglitz, and we think that is the realm of economics. In fact, at its very root, at its very root, economics is about serving one another to survive and live well and to safeguard the means of that survival for the whole of all of us. That's what economics is supposed to be. It's a means of, a tool for survival, wellness of the whole, not just of me. It's not about me getting rich because I'm so smart and I'm so capable and I've got this right and there's nobody better than me and therefore I can accumulate wealth and it's mine and if it's up to my discretion whether I want to even give anyone anything or share it. No, no. It's about ensuring the wellness, the survival, the wellness of that on which we depend for one another. Yes, so that's I need to make sure you're okay in order for this planet to be okay, in order for this earth to be okay. It's that it's that complicated and yet that incredibly simple. In some verses in the Quran, it seems to sort of pop out again sort of it would seem unrelatedly because you've gone from one, one story of Jesus to something else about uh, an admonition not to cheat. Because in the old days, they used to have these, uh, old days, before, they used to have these weighing scales, you know, where you, you have uh, this, this uh, iron scale and, on one, and you have to weigh the things on one side or the other, right? Um, that still remains a symbol of justice in most parts of the world. So the, the advocacy, the admonition in the, in the Quran is... Um, so in the same uh, paragraph, so to speak, where it says you must make sure that when it's, when it's time to do prayers, when you hear the call to prayer, you leave, you leave everything you're doing, you leave your barter economy, you leave everything and make sure that you attend to the prayer, right? And then it says, and do not cheat on that scale. Do not put some, because sometimes they would put some, something to make it look like it's more heavy. And actually what you get is a lot less than what you think you've paid for or what you think you've asked for. Basic concept of cheating, very basic, nothing complicated about that. Do not cheat. You do not cheat. Why? Because if you, if you cheat, the implication is you are not attending to the prayer. Yes, you are not attending to the memory of the divine. You are not being responsible to what it is that you owe the divine in terms of one another's relationship. So my relationship, my, my cheating of you isn't just a cheating of you as a person. It is a cheating of, it's actually a discord that has happened, a dissonance that is happening with my creator in turn with the entire balance of this earth that I am supposed to be a member of. So this is part of that understanding. So what are the implications for economics? Gee, let's just look at the fact that we think in economic terms of the survival of the fittest. We are currently globally having rulers who, have, who hold the entire responsibility for running their kingdoms with an attitude of me, myself, and I. And if you align yourself with me, you're part of the good clique, you're gonna get better access to the resources and uh, you, can, you can live as well as you want as an emperor. This attitude that we have from our rulers down and from many of us up, because we don't take the responsibility, some of us for that, this attitude is fundamentally antithetical, not only to Islam, it is antithetical to all faiths, it is antithetical to the notion of creation, which demands that we are responsible stewards for the whole of the creation. And that to lose one element of that or to cheat on any element of that is to cheat all of our obligation to serve and to live well with together. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, powerful uh, talk that you just gave. Um, I, I'm not, not going to summarize it here, but I just um, really like this expression, the fabric of existence, which might be some summary of, of what you just said. And I also found it really interesting that you pointed out that the, the 
philosophy of enlightenment actually is quite antithetical to this to this um, holistic thinking of interdependency um, and also that the philosophy of the enlightenment is actually the foundation of modern economics um, Yes, I'm just going to hand over to Celia Graupe now, and I think that also her perspective of, of Buddhism might yeah, um, tie in quite nicely with what you have just said. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Atina and, and Aza. Um, I think we could just start talking and have, a, have a, lots of conversations and um, lots of uh, sameness, but also differences. And I, I just tried just to make some short notions about um, Buddhism and then try to just show uh, some of my work where I try to interlink economics directly, the, the, hum the, the picture, the economic picture of, of, of the human being uh, with, a, with other perspectives, which are religious and in this uh, special case, uh, are a Buddhist. Um, so if you look at, at Buddhism, um, it starts uh, with a fundamental uh, notion, which is um, at first sight quite negative, but it's, but, uh, because it says all, um, uh, all life is suffering. Um, so it doesn't start with uh, everything is all right, but it starts with a deep sense of crisis. So people say you can't have to do anything with Buddhism if you think everything is fine. So you just have to start, uh, or you start meditating and get into religious life if you have a sense of crisis. And I think that's quite perfect for, for many people um, um, at this present time. And then there are three different uh, insights which are interconnected and which um, you also mentioned in, in, in the other religions. So, so there's a, a circle of three different uh, poisons as they are called. The first is ignorance. You don't know what you're a human being. You don't know about the world. And this is why you make wrong decisions. And that's why um, you, are get, you cannot get out of this um, suffering circle. And the second poison is greed. And the third poison is hatred. Um, because if you're greedy, then your ego grows and it's just too big. So it starts um, getting into contact with other egos and then you just have to protect yourself or you have a feeling, an ignorant feeling of you have to protect yourself and then you create hatred. And so, so there's always this circle and you have to break it at, at some point. And this is basically all the ways uh, Buddhism is talking about. And so I think it's quite perfect um, for speaking about um, economics and the economy, because as Yaza just said, the basic thing of um, the economy today is to say that greed is all right. And that is just like the, the basic um, power that makes societies grow and prosper. And, and for me, what's interesting, that this is what I just want to show now, that economics as a science is for me is a science of ignorance because it's creating ignorance about what we are as a human being. So we have a, in, in German, the word for economy and economics is like the same, economy. I say, well, it's a, it's a very powerful combination of ignorance and greed, which creating hatred and the impossibility to fight hatred. Um, so, so, so it's a, a perfect, um, unbreakable circle of, um, of suffering. And what I try to show now that uh, some, some of my newer work, which is directed on how we conceive the human nature, and it's not Buddhist, it's not Islam, but it's a try to get a powerful new idea of what we are as human beings so we can discuss religions, because if you have like the mainstream um, uh, idea of the human being, uh, we don't even see what Atina and Aza and I am trying to talking about. So I'm just trying to share my screen and just show, throw some pictures at you. I try to do this in a, in a, in a, um, um, as, as fast as I can. Um, what we have today um, in, in economics is that the, the idea of homo economicus, which is idea of being rational, conscious um, human beings who can calculate the best what they want and who can calculate their greed and their human, their utility maximization, profit maximization. And this is um, the small tip of an iceberg. And um, in the 20th century, and especially now in, um, in, um, uh, in, uh, in um, behavioral economics, 
And also in um, psychology, we have discovered that there's a huge irrational and unconscious bottom of this rational behavior, but we don't think that we can educate it. We don't think that we can change our basic human beings. So there's just the idea of creating choice architectures where you can channel the human motivations of greed and everything into some kind of um, uh, constellation which is all right for society. So there's no idea been, uh, beyond the idea of rational calculation that we can do something consciously about um, our, um, of our humaneness. And if you look at this and you just think of what Atina and Aza talked about, then there's no, no, no way because they were talking about uh, really creating imagination, about creating compassion and everything. And it's just missing out of the picture. So there's nothing uh, we, we, we have. And so what I'm trying to do, and I'm just coming back to Buddhism in a second, they we say, well, no, there's just complete wrong um, guiding me um, cognition guiding me metaphor and um, talking about an iceberg because it's just solid it's just unchanging and it's just creating this um, circle of suffering and it goes on forever and forever because there's no point of change and I'm trying to um, talk about the human uh, about our human nature and just think of it like um, our blue planet of uh, like our earth because the core um, the core difference is if you look at it, you just go back to your geography books, which you had like in school in the sixth grade or something, then you have like a, the dynamic is we have a fluid um, core uh, where things change and, and then these basic upper structures, it's just hardened. It's just, and if you don't have any uh, capability of having a, a fluid, um, a, a fluid kind of, um, dynamics, then there's impossible to have a, a functional earth. And so um, if you have this metaphor, you just see what we have in economics at present is that you just have a very, very solid structure that is not possible to adapt to change and is not a, possible to create something new out of change. So to talk about the capability of, 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 of humans to respond to nature, to respond to our neighbors, everything that Aza and Atina just said, then it's just, it's just missing. So here you just have habits. This is like what I call ordinary understanding. And you just have an abstract reason, which is completely disconnected from, from your experience. And if you go now to, 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 uh, to Buddhism, and I think also to other religions, um, then you say, well, what we have is what I hear call a creative void. It's called a, like a social magma. So we have like this inherent um, dynamic, which is not calculable, calculable which is um, uncertain and which is radically new. And we have to develop our human nature to be able um, to, to deal with this um, radical openness um, um, of, of society, of nature, of the cosmos, and of ourselves. And this is what Buddhism basically says, that uh, suffering um, just develops uh, because we are not, we, we think that everything is unchanging. We want to cling to our ego, we want to cling to our habits, we want to cling to our money and uh, to, to goods and material goods. And But to be able to really um, create something out of nothing to create something out of the spontaneous interaction uh, with our human uh, with other human beings and with nature this is called in philosoph philosophy in um, western uh, classical philosophy like the sensus communis gemeins in, in in german is really to be able to work down to earth and to really see where the suffering is and and to act um, especially and as you see, if you have an economics that and then the education system that is just telling people that this upper things are just everything to human humanity, you're not able to do any change. You're not able to change your habits. And this is what we see at present, that despite uh, um, pandemic risks, despite climate change, despite 
um, um, inequality, rising inequality, we are not able to change our habits. And this is like a big um, part that we have to develop our human, uh, humanity, which is, has to do with the capability of sensing um, direct experience and creating new imaginations. And this is what you, Aza, I think just said, it's sort of like uh, reading religious texts is about um, developing our imagination, the possibilities, how things could be. And then also to have a practical reasoning to put things into practice and to create new habits, um, which are um, better suitable um, for, for the world we actually live in. And so last picture, and then I just, uh, then I, I will end for this, say, when we don't have any kind of um, possibilities to educate ourselves and our fellow human beings in uh, dealing with the, with the world as it is in its dynamics and uncertainty, that something like this will happen. I think this is what crisis does. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have it in English, but you, I think you'll get the idea. So if you have a void here, then we have dynamic changes in society, which I call social magma, and there's nothing capable of rebuilding our world and rebuilding our human nature, and that just um, erupts in crisis and afterwards we just go on as if nothing happened and so I think this is um, also a goal of Buddhism of really going under the surface so you have a Buddha in Zen Buddhism you have a saying that you have to throw light what uh, to be able to throw light and uh, what is underneath your own feet um, and I think this is just a, a, a very nice picture say so, well we we can't just be this rational being and not able to get into contact with the real dynamics of the world. And we have, create, we have to create um, capabilities and educations or religious meditation or whatever. I don't care if it's called Buddhist or Christian or, or whatever, but if we don't have this basic uh, capability of dealing with the world as it is, we will end up in this um, crisis and it will just repeat itself and goes on um, basically forever. And we can't get out of this circle of ignorance, hatred, and, and greed. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and I think it, it really greatly tied in with what has been said before, with uh, what Ar Athena and, and Aza um, just said from, from their perspectives of Christianity and, and Islam. Um, and I also like that you try to link this back to the homo economicus um, and to mainstream economics and basically pointing out that mainstream economics is um, just like um, keeping up the circle of ignorance and greed and, and actually cannot, cannot offer us any way out of this, of this, of this thinking. Um, that's also a question I would like to ask you later, like how to get out of this circle. <laughs> um, but first of all, um, I want to... Um, go on to, I wanted to pose a question to Arthur and um, first of all, I want to formulate it in a general way and then a bit more concretely. So generally, um, my question would be, what does this, what we have discussed right now mean for a systemic transformation or a transformation towards a more just, a more sustainable um, economic order? And um, the question to Arthur would be, um, so when we talk about decolonization, uh, this is also like a theme of our summer academy, how to decolonize economics. Um, so unraveling post or neocolonial power relations. So does this also imply another perspective on religion in the context of international cooperation? I think this would be a question you might be able to answer, but it's a very, very vast question. And I, I it would be nice if you could like give a very short answer if possible, because we also want to still leave some, have some time for, for questions from the audience, but I think this would be interesting to, to go into this direction. Sure, I'd love to, but can you, do you mind just repeating the question again? Because you said a lot of things and then I, I kind of lost the question. <laughs> so what was the yes. question? So my question would be when, when, we, when we are talking about decolonization, so does this also imply another perspective on religion in the, in the context of international uh, cooperation? Great, thank you. In fact, um, many of the questions that I saw in the chat uh, 
actually can tie into this rather mm -hmm. nicely because there's this notion of is morality only religious or can we not speak of morality outside of religion and when you work in an international secular organization in, like for instance the united nations where i worked for almost 20 years before i joined religions for peace i had exactly the same set of questions being leveraged you know why do we need religion in this space at all you know we have the universal declaration of human rights we have the common values that are enshrined therein and there if we if we adhere to those whether we are governments or non-governmental um, uh, structures, we should be fine. We should be absolutely well. The problem is that there's a lack of adherence to those uh, universal principles, if you will, which is actually quite correct. The problem is that there is a lack of adherence, a systemic lack of adherence. So whether we're talking about governments or non-governmental entities or even the private sector entities, whatever they are, even religious entities, there is a lack of adherence to these very common, very basic values. We forget, however, that these values, these common values that are today enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the mantra of the international development and, and foreign affairs community, that these very values came from that which was common to all faiths, all religious traditions. That did, if, we, if we had not had the religious traditions as we know them today, we wouldn't have actually been able to evolve these common values. You know, where do we think we were just born so darn smart that we could figure out the common values to everybody? Obviously, we had to learn from something. There's a source, there's a root. There's a, a Pew research study in 2012 in which it was uh, clearly articulated that 84% of the world's population claimed adherence to a particular religious tradition. 84%, that's eight out of 10 people. So those of us who have such, a, such an acerbic view of religion need to nevertheless appreciate that eight out of 10 people in this world, this interdependent world of ours, actually believe in a faith tradition of some sort, right? So whether we think it's necessary to bring religion in or not is quite frankly, hardly the point. The point is that we're talking about interdependence in our existence as human beings with each other, with our earth, with our planet, with our universe. That interdependence requires at a minimum that we are respectful of the fact that we will think different and that some of us have a particular orientation and, and compulsion that comes from a particular religious tradition. We have to respect that. It, we can speak about morality for sure as, as enshrined, if you will, in, in a universal declaration of human rights. There's morality right there, powerful. It is a morality based on many religious, if not all common religious traditions and values, which some people live by. Eight out of 10 people will claim an affiliation to. I would love to see if we were to, to do this a similar Pew research study on every single human being and simply ask them, so to what extent do you believe in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? I would love to see what the result of that is, quite frankly, because the average person will, will affiliate with their faith tradition. I mean, I'm talking about the average person around the world, not in Western Europe, but around the world will actually affiliate with a religious or faith tradition much sooner than they will affiliate even with their national uh, country of origin or what have you. So th that reality is important to keep in mind. And that is exactly what we would say, what I would say to my uh, in colleague colleagues who work within these very secular structures to say that's it's, it's important that we have secular structures. It's critical to have these secular infrastructures that are there for governance, that are there for everyday civic existence. Absolutely critical to have that secular space. The secular space, however, does not deny the religious existence and affiliation and emotional attachment and compulsion that eight out of 10 people have. For us to be able to appreciate who we are, we have to appreciate that most of us have a particular belief and a belief system that we adhere to. It's as simple as that. So, there's a difference between saying morality and secularism are supposed to be all encompassing and they should be the framework of our guidance apart from religion. That is quite correct, but that does not mean and, is, and should not be the same as completely disregarding the value of religion in eight out of 10 people's lives. We have to understand, and this is what we got from Celia's excellent uh, present series of presentations. You know, you, if you disconnect the, the, the faith, the belief, the compassion, the, the how we are and what we believe. And if you disconnect entirely and try to set up structures that are not connected to that, you, you disconnect from that which is human. You are quintessentially setting up edifices and structures and policies which are not taking into account that which makes the heart beat in so many people. 
it literally is what makes the heart beat. So why do we think we can do that? International development today, I have seen in my 20 years in the United Nations system, I have seen a shift of 180 degrees. And I like to think sometimes that I was part of that shift, uh, even though I'm pretty worried about it. But anyway, the shift has gone from not thinking that religion matters at all. It's really not, we don't, we don't do religion. And I quote many of my distinguished colleagues, we don't do religion, right? To a, a state of affairs right now where religion seems to be so darn popular that everybody's doing religion and it makes you wonder, what are you doing? And we go from absolute disinterest and marginalization to now recentering and focusing and essentializing. And that's dangerous. That's dangerous. There's supposed to be a middle way, which is one of the things all religious traditions, but especially Buddhism is very focused and keen on. There's supposed to be a middle way there somewhere. It's not this extreme or that extreme. Currently, actually, I can tell you very, very confidently, currently the United Nations system and many governments around the world are actually a little bit overly focused on the religious. Not out of a sense all of a sudden that good, oh my heavens, how wonderful was this? No, but I, out of two other concerns, the large majority of them are two, two kinds of concerns. One concern that says, we have to control this phenomenon. We really need to, because it's the root of all evil. And that usually applies to Islam. Usually there's like a, this, a small jump and we suddenly are talking about Islam, Muslim extremism, terrorism, you name it. So one attitude is we have to control this, yeah? Because it's getting out of hand here. The other attitude, unfortunately, is one of how can we use this? It's a very instrumentalist attitude, always said in the most gracious uh, and, and lovely of ways and manners and so on, but it's, it really is quintessentially about using this particular way of this belief system, these, the, the institutions and the incredible role they play because we learned a very basic fact, which most people seem to know, except us policymakers in secular spaces, which is that most of uh, the social services that we know of today, that are today provided by some governments, most of the original health care, nutrition, sanitation, education, most of this is provided in so many parts of the world by and through religious institutions. I am a Muslim. I went to a Catholic school in Egypt. So please explain to me how that happens. Please explain to me how it is that at the height of the COVID disaster here in New York City, New York City, Central Park, which I'm sure everybody has heard of, Central Park had, at the height of the COVID disaster, a massive tent set up by Samaritans First, which is a religious organization, in order to help the government and privately funded universities, uh, sorry, uh, uh, hospitals, cope with the overflow of patients and dead bodies. It had to be set up and they were already serving, these religious institutions were serving, the hospitals were being run. 70% of hospitals in the United States are run by and through the Catholic Church. So this is just the healthcare space. If we are to look at all the other places of social services, we would be able to realize that the economy of our world, the economics, the basic economics actually does incorporate a critical element of what these religious institutions are serving. They are part of the economy of our world purely through their service provision capacity. These are institutions serving communities and people, part of the economy infrastructure in any country around the world, including right here in the United States of America. In Geneva at one point, and Athena can, can correct this, but there was clarity from an, an, an announcement from Caritas that they were serving 5,000 people at the height of the COVID disaster. On a given day, they were, they were giving food and shelter to about 5,000 people. Caritas in Geneva, Switzerland, which is one of the richest nations on earth. Now, needless to say, the other rich nations in the Gulf have always had religious institutions serving their people uh, for gazillion since they were before even they became into existence as nation states. The truth of the matter is the religious industry, the religious space is part of our economic space. It is part of our foreign policy space. Some countries, some governments are very clearly religious in their orientation, some even which used to be secular from the Eastern European bloc, which used to be secular not so long ago and very much shunning of religion are today in cahoots with particular churches and working very, very strongly with the consent, assent and participation of the religious uh, institution. So there is no such thing as a space in which religion doesn't exist that we can then speak of very, very uh, informed in such a way. Thank you. Thanks for your very comprehensive answer and also for pointing out all these these figures that I'm sure that um, 
many many people in Germany or in other countries that see themselves basically as secular are not not really aware of. And um, I just want to um, pose the question to Athena. And I mean, I wrote on a similar question in my script, but I will just read it out from the comment because someone else wrote wrote this. Except exact same question here. Um, religions are often seen to manifest themselves in an ugly way throughout the world and generate a sense of indifference, apathy, and hatred, or co or competition among people of different religions. So, I mean, I, I think you you this is a criticism that often is is like like leveled against against religion. That um, so, how would you respond to this kind of criticism, Athena? Thank you so much um, for, for, for that um, yeah, really, really important question. And uh, for all that I have said um, previously about um, um, uh, Christian religious teaching and the focus on caring uh, for neighbor and creation, um, I think it's, 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 it's really unfortunate um, uh, that historically uh, speaking, um, and I will speak for the uh, the Christian tradition and, and Christian churches, historically speaking, um, our own um, uh, religious um, institutions and churches um, have not been uh, the, um, um, the 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 key um, uh, uh, practitioners of of, of Christ's uh, teaching, and uh, and I would uh, I would specifically uh, mention, um, for instance, uh, the role of uh, churches um, in for instance, a transatlantic um, uh, slave trade, uh, the role of Christian churches uh, uh, in this. Um, and you know, uh, one could cite um, um, many more um, instances where uh, uh, religion, uh, instead of being an alternative voice, um, has actually uh, cited um, with the powerful, um, and um, and again, I speak very much also for for uh, for my own um, uh, religious uh, uh, tradition, uh, and I think it was um, I think it was the 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 uh, economic ethicist um, Peter Ulrich um, who was saying that is in fact like. Um, ironic that uh, that Christian churches um, such as WCC, for instance, um, today are one of uh, the most uh, vocal critiques of global cap capitalism, but at the same time, um, historically uh, speaking, um, Protestant churches um, in particular um, um, have also uh, played a, a key role in a way in in um, in in elevating um, you know the market <laughs> um, into um, uh, the sphere of of, um, of morals as well, uh, and I think this uh, this just speaks to really the the uh, complexity of the of the human condition. Uh, but but having said that, having said that, still. Um, Having said that, I think there is still a tremendous, tremendous potential and role um, for uh, for religion in transforming um, the current uh, uh, socioeconomic order uh, for the better. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, as uh, as has mentioned that. Um, Perhaps um, presently there is maybe too much of too much of a focus um, on religion. Um, uh, to uh, and I think part of that part of that also has to do with with um, for instance the 2008 um, um, global financial crash. Part of it has to do you know with the utter failure of um, of of of, of, uh, of Trickle down um, economics, and and um, one you know one could argue that um, um, one of the most basic um, religious precepts, um, you know, common to 
um, most, I would say all religions, you know, the, 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 real, the basic religious precept, for instance, that um, um, foul methods do not yield uh, fair results. This religious teaching has pretty much um, weathered, I would say, um, um, empirical uh, testing. And so there is a tremendous role, as I said, um, uh, for um, uh, religions um, in questioning and in and, and, and reorienting um, the values um, um, that are undergirding uh, economic, um, uh, economics and, and global capitalism. Um, but having, of course, also said that, um, I would also say that not just economic concepts, but obviously religious concepts um, have to be always subjected um, to critical examination and uh, for those of us who are um, um, uh, religious minded, um, we have to be open um, to modifying and even completely junking um, interpretations of religious texts and teachings, uh, you know, when they become you know, untenable or, 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 or even um, harmful. So I uh, think, um, yeah, I will. And there, I, I'm not sure that I've been able to respond to that difficult question, but it is an attempt. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks for your answer. And it's a, it's a, difficult, a difficult question indeed, yeah. Um, I, am, I think some of the um, questions in the Q&A have already been touched upon, um, but there's an interesting question um, I think because it concerns um, heterodox economics and I'm just going to read it out. Um, in how far can this idea of interdependency um, karam, as a karam lined out be spread via heterodox economics and within different schools of thought? Okay, uh, thank, thank you so much. And I just want to go back to, to this difficult, quite difficult question Atina just had. Um, I think there are so many religious uh, sources and resources who really try to be critical with their own religion and really to try to, to help people, as others said, and to try to rebuild their institutions. And for example, I'm a Christian because I'm born as a Christian. I'm not converted to Buddhism because I think it's like the peaceful religion, which is obviously isn't, but it's just seen as this in the Western world. But to try to bring this into my own religion, to try to make changes to the institution, and so so I think it's and it's really dangerous if you don't have all if you don't get all this um, potential to really make changes in economics and the economy where the real danger comes from in the moment. Which brings me to to this question you you just asked. So um, what we have, and it goes also back to what Azar says that in the Enlightenment, in the Western Enlightenment, and then in economics, that we really try, uh, think that um, distancing us from experience is the solution. And there's a distancing about because of the money, which makes us just calculating. And there's a distancing what we do with students around the world because of thinking just in models and think that ideas of harmony and equality and so on can be done in some, um, some spheres of calculation and, and modeling and, and so on. And I think what heterodox economics can do, and it does, for example, with John Maynard Keynes and, and others, and also Marx, it says, well, we have to start with the basic experience of suffering in this economy. And this is what I also want to bring in from Buddhism, but I also think from other religions, it said, well, there are people suffering, there are people starving, um, uh, starving to death, and uh, and to really see what we can do about it. And there's so much suffering. I'm also working directly with uh, very rich people. And there's so much suffering because of all the, the uh, fear these people have to lose what they have and, and so on. And really just say, can we just start there? And this is what we also try to do in economic education to really get into your own experience. So, so make people go to the supermarket and say, well, um, what do you really experience? And you can feel that you're connected to thousands and millions and billions of people, but you can't create these interconnections because they are all, um, they don't have any voice and you don't have any voice and you can just talk about uh, the means of money with people, but you can't control the means of money itself. 
and and to bring in this um, ability to work in uh, in um, circumstances where you can feel the power of making changes. As you said, as you said in, in Central Park, there was the power of dealing with direct suffering. And then you see the institutions are not right to do this, um, to help people uh, dying from COVID-19 because of the economization of the um, public sector and the health sector. So it's not just about just helping uh, people directly, but if you really have the experience, then economics comes in, heterodox economics, and should help um, people to understand what the changes have, um, have to be made on the institutional, on the conventional level. And what we have uh, um, at present in economics is that, as I talk, it's just this upper crust um, we have of a very distant um, idea and we're not going to have any solutions to our basic problems um, on this level. Um, but also um, institutionalized religions will not help, but you really have to go, as Asa said, and Atina, there's 80% of people who have or can make their direct experiences about humaneness, uh, which is trained by means of religious traditions. And to start there and then to see how can we build and rebuild institutions, religious and also secular institutions. And uh, so coming back to heterodox economics, we have to deal with direct experience of production um, and distribution. So all the old themes of, um, of the old form of political economy and then to try, as others said, we have to try to find language expressions um, to do this and to, to talk about it on an abstract level to rebuild institutions. Yes, thank you very much for your answer. Um, there's a question by uh, Colin McCallow. Um, um, so if you want to uh, pose this question yourself, Colin, you can unmute and that your question now. Yeah, thank you very much. Greetings from England. Um, I want to ask a question to all the panelists, really. Uh, I would be particularly interested for my own purpose to know the non-Christian, uh, non-Islamic view, because I'm more familiar with those two. Uh, but this is relating to economics and the role of religion religious teaching and the institutions laying down rules for life uh, and specifically the economic rule, which I know was true in Christianity in the past, but not now, and is still, I think, true in Islam, that you should not lend money for interest. Uh, now, I believe before the Reformation, this was the teaching of the, the Western Catholic Church, at least, and then it got dissipated did. And certainly the Protestant Reformation is often seen as being an element of the social change leading to the rise of capitalism within which credit finance and debt and monetary interest is, is a, a key part of the extraction that leads to inequality. And uh, the workshop that I'm in at the summer school is then also driving a growth imperative which impacts on uh, climate change and the environment. Um, do, do you feel that that is something that is uh, uh, a central issue as to whether uh, religions should lay down rules that therefore have ep economic and en environmental implications? Yeah, just a quick... Muted. So to whom do you want to post, the, post oh, this well, question? To, to anybody, but um, I would be I'd be interested in, in in the Christian and Islamic view, but also the, um, the something from another religion or from no religion at all. Yeah. So, is there anyone who would, would like to answer? Maybe Aza. Um, yeah, I mean, I can and just start because uh, Buddhism is obviously not Christianity and not Islam. Um, so, so it's quite interesting that, that for long historic experience. Um, we don't really have societies based on money. Um, so, so there's a lot of religious um, ideas and practices uh, that are directed to an economy that is not money driven. 
And then we have to see the development of money only recently. And then there's a problem that uh, there's no adequate or religious, um, uh, religious uh, answer to it. Um, as we would quite say, so there's also in, in Buddhism, but it's, it's a very, it, we don't have such Buddhism like the Catholic Church. Um, so, so there's a, a high variety in it. Um, but basically, um, the problem with interest, um, Buddhists say, well, that is just ignorance and greed uh, put together. Um, because um, you have to deal with the future and you have to give something back that is based on abstract um, ideas and based on, on the past. But there's the whole idea of future, open future development cannot be um, expressed um, because you're dealing um, the whole of the future in, in the means of interest. So, so it's mere slavation of, of um, our future capabilities. And so, so there's a strict um, critics of it, but it's not so much in institutional um, Buddhism um, because um, as I said, there's no real historic experience uh, where Buddhism developed. It wasn't such a theme, which is a difference to the Western world where we have uh, 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 schemes of interest um, already back to the Roman times and also um, virulent in, in the times of the historic Jesus, for example. So, so the uh, scripts uh, are dealing with it uh, much, much more explicit than, than for example, Buddhism. Um, but, but you also, but it would also be always to go back to, see, to see what, what is the suffering created with it? What is the mechanism behind the suffering? And, and then to, to try to get out of it. Um, maybe, thank you very much for that, Celia. And I, I think just a, a, um, a particular anecdote that I think somewhat, not necessarily answers, but may perhaps even begs the question that was asked. I think the issue isn't that we have to reconceptualize how is it that religions contribute to economy and economics because the truth is that they have been contributing systematically to economy and economics since time immemorial, since even before we had a term for economy and economics. Um, and the fact is that these religious, many of these religious institutions, if not all of them, are part of the economic infrastructure of community, nation, globe already. That's just a given reality. So we, I mean, we, we can, of course, imagine that they're not, but the fact is that they are already, these religious institutions. So the question that I find most interesting, by the way, having worked, again, to go back to the UN context, is we don't do religion to now there's a tremendous interest in Islamic finance, right? You, you go anywhere and it's about Islamic finance. And I'm kind of a bit intrigued by that and, and somewhat also, to be honest with you, somewhat irritated by it. You know, on the one hand, there is this deep concern uh, with everything Islamic and Islam, right? Uh, and, 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 a, and it's very relatively prevalent tendency to um, stereotype Islam, Muslims, etc. And yet, on the other hand, there is this and, and, and you have this idea that we, well, we don't really care what religion does or should do, or religious institutions are really not part of this infrastructure of international development, to then this other space happening simultaneously, which is, my goodness, do you know that if we were to take Islamic finance into account, we would be talking something to the, to the effect of, I don't know how, and there's a figure quoted, billions of US dollars that are available to be invested, to be used, to da 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 And I'm thinking, no, really, um, so we, we have a problem with Islam, Muslims. Uh, and then at the same time, we seem to think that Islamic finance is a mighty interesting concept and idea and should be uh, you know, harvested and used. And, and the, the, tr the truth here is that this attitude, this perception isn't just a matter by non-Muslims. This isn't just non-Muslims who, who think that Islamic finance is a big deal and needs to be properly owned by the, the global international community and, and you know, positioned and invested and blah, blah, blah. It isn't just... Um, non-Muslims who have this perspective. A lot of Muslims whom I believe are genuinely uh, uh, 
worried about this idea of being put in a camp of terrorists most of the time, are quite eager to put the, push forward the notion that Islamic finance is a thing for good. It's a means for good. That if you were to, you know, you can have this, these units inside the UN entities on, on uh, humanitarian affairs, on children, on whatever, and it's, they're, they're given, they're able to uh, work with Islamic finance. It's going to lead to so much, much needed resources for this work of international development that is meant to serve everybody. And therefore, this is a very good thing. We really should try to seek to uh, mainstream Islamic finance and harvest it. And everybody needs to know what's happening with Islamic finance and so on. To be honest with you, to me, that tendency, quite apart from what I think about it, that tendency in and of itself already shows you how integrated religious institutions and actors are in the international political economy of our world. So it's not that we have to reinvent something. We simply have to look at what's already happening and be better aware, be better learned. Remember, I started my presentation saying it's about knowledge and learning. We need to be better learned about what is going on, not because we think it's all good or all bad, but because we need to understand how these, this, this, these religious universes are already very much integrated into the space that today we think is secular and is completely disconnected. But at the same time, this helps, this actually turns makes us turn a blind eye to what is happening in these religious networks and institutions that is fundamentally part of our economic ecosystem. Thank you. Thanks for your answer, Arthur. Um, so there's another question by Eduardo. Um, and if you're ready, you could unmute yourself and state the question. Um, I think it would be directed to Athena. Um, because it's also about Christianity. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. And thanks for your honest thoughts. I really enjoyed. And Athena, I think you are the person that might answer it better because I talk from my Christian experience or X perspective. And I wonder whether the principle of responsibility that was talked about by Atza Karam, sorry for the pronunciation, and uh, or the ability to decide between right and wrong are betrayed by institution, by churches sometimes, not structurally, uh, and they then express a conservative force on policy making, in particular, like uh, the denial of, a, on a, of an open and dynamic sexuality uh, or a plural gender identification or the non androcentric or caste like interpretation of the olive writings, which is still something that belongs to very little amount of people which are male, uh, are the reason for which the participation of religious forces into politics and shaping economy differently is jammed or instrumentalized by other forces. Thank you again for this, this very rich question, very difficult uh, 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 question again. And I think in, 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 in even phrasing, your question, you've kind of like answered some of <laughs> um, uh, some of the points um, uh, that, that, that you have raised. And, and I think I've already did um, um, uh, uh, share earlier that um, yes, uh, Christianity has this rich, um, beautiful, um, you know, reserve of teachings, um, but churches are, um, social institutions as well, embedded um, <laughs> in society. Um, uh, and um, to some extent, um, uh, 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 aside from um, being uh, also bearers of values, they themselves um, absorb uh, um, uh, prevailing uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, you know, we, we are, as churches embedded in, con in certain contexts and certain cultures, we don't exist in a vacuum. <laughs> um, and so there's always this tension um, with, you know, the, the rich and beautiful teachings and what exactly churches as, as, as institutions or Christians as, uh, uh, um, as, um, uh, as, as individuals uh, do. Um, and I think that is part of the human condition. I mean, how, how to be um, consistent with um, as individuals, uh, but also as churches and institutions to be 
to the um, uh, value sum uh, uh, that we uh, purport uh, to hold dearly. And very clearly, um, the, 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 the Christian call to love your neighbor includes everyone, everyone. Um, and, and yet, uh, we cannot um, um, you know, uh, discriminate on the basis of, of gender, on the basis of race, um, on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, the call to love your neighbor is super inclusive. And, and in fact, um, we, we even say that this, you know, that the, we even have to expand the notion of um, who our neighbor um, is um, to, you know, to, to, to look beyond human beings, but also to consider, you know, the rest of creation. Uh, uh, so, um, I, 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 I struggle with this because obviously um, I, I imagine that it's not just in Christianity, but I, it's probably in, 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 in all religions. I mean, there will, you know, it's not a, it's not a homogeneous uh, kind of um, uh, thing. Um, uh, Christianity, there will be like right wing, there will be left wing, <laughs> uh, Christianity. And um, I think that you speak um, also from what uh, is happening um, in, in some parts of the world, and I can <laughs> name countries uh, where uh, religion uh, has, and, and in particular the Christian uh, uh, religion, um, you know, has joined forces um, uh, with 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 politics um, and not just um, any politics, but also the kind of politics um, that excludes and um, uh, that exploits and that discriminates. And that is completely, you know, <laughs> against Christ's teaching. But yes, unfortunately, um, um, there, is, there is collusion. Um, um, uh, be between churches as institutions, it, it happens um, uh, not just um, with um, uh, certain governments, but also with, um, with with certain economic systems and structures. But I think we always have to go back to you know the core, hold on to the core, <laughs> um, uh, the core values um, uh, uh, of, of Christianity. Um, Love for neighbor, care for creation, um, and and this is this is really the the um, uh, uh, that the the religious bearings that and that we 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 kind of have to hold on to in, in this crazy world <laughs> uh, we live in. But thanks thanks so much um, um, for your for your question, which I think really lays out the complexity <laughs> of. Um, religion um, in economy and, and in society. Thanks for your answer, Athena. And also thanks to Asa for answering the, the questions in written form in the Q&A. I think you also answered some other questions uh, in written form. And um, so we will copy these answers and also make them av available uh, later so they won't be uh, gone after this meeting. Um, now the time is almost over and I would like to post one last post one last question to, to Celia and I already mentioned it before. Um, you said that uh, like mainstream economics is just like reinforcing this whole cycle of of of, of greed and, and suffering. You said that it's a combination of ignorance and greed basically. So the question would be like how to get out of get out of this uh, this uh, this circle. Um, so so how how can we what what should be what would be the necessary steps towards towards the transformation? Um, I know it's a very very big question, but maybe you could answer it in a um, kind of a final final statement, and then we would end this discussion. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to go back what what Azza said that um, um, at present we are really in Western society prone to to point at at Islam and say, well, there all the mistakes come from. 
And so, so what is what is important from a Buddhist perspective that you start with the suffering is where you're part from it, where you're also a cause, and you don't say, well, just my religion is very nice, and I'm so I'm just pointing out the good facts of your life. When you say, well, where's the suffering that I am co-creating with? For example. When I started my university, we are still state accredited, which is a system which does enormous epistemic violence to young people and young uh, students around the world. And they say, well, I want to be part of it, which is always um, difficult and where you make yourself guilty. But at the same time, you have the, ch the chance to make changes that are not just for your personal life, but that makes change to society. And so to, to really find the spot, and that's why I always say young people go to into institutions that are difficult, that are guilty or sinful or whatever you might term it, and not just point on others and say, well, they should change, because you always can always change yourself. Yeah, and then really to go into it and say, well, here's a suffering, like having a uh, problems of the family or health issues and say, so, so what is the cause of it? And uh, for example, for me in economic education, it's really a, a tremendous suffering for young students to be separated from practical life and from experience. So they really want to learn how to change their world and they're just put into this world of models. And to say, well, how can I help with, all, with what I have and with my power to bring a change to a system where I'm also part of. I'm still calling myself an economist. But at the same time, they don't want to be an economist. It's just people that are making lots of suffering in this world. And we have lots of young students coming to our university and say, well, I want to train, be trained in economics, but I don't want to be an economist. I want to be something nice. And they say, no, it's not nice. Um, but when you're an economist, you can make a difference to a system that is considered for yourself as wrong. Um, and so, so the, I think really to say is to, to stay with yourself. And in Buddhism, it's not about being on the good side, but it's to, to um, get back to, to a place where the distinction between good and ba bad originates and to create a whole new ground. And so I don't don't wait to find a very nice religion and a super powerful science, but just start somewhere where you really feel that there's a suffering that makes difference for your life and that you really want to change and then you cling on to it. And I think in every religious experience, um, experience is not about nice. It's not about well-being. It's not about just happiness, but it's about really being about suffering about darkness and you go to the islamic um, teachers you go to the christian teachers and then you go into this darkness and as the night comes as you say in judaism and the jewish tradition there's first the night and then comes the morning and we economic uh, the economy tries to say that we can have life without darkness it doesn't work for buddhism doesn't work for so much religious traditions and this is what I'm interested in, that there are so many people, so much, as I said, so many readings and scriptures being able to tell us how to cope with this darkness, how to cling on to something which you really want. And so th this is what I'm interested in. And yes, of course, we do a lot of mistakes. We create a lot of sufferings in religious institutions, try to hold to those people who try to stay there and make some differences. Okay, thank you very much. I think that this was a really nice uh, closing closing statement for this this discussion. So a big big thank you to all our panelists for for this engaging and inspiring discussion. Um, it was a real pleasure to to have you here tonight. Um, before I ending this meeting, I would like to announce tomorrow's lecture, um, which is um, done by economic historian and uh, best-selling author Adam Tooze who will analyze the current COVID-19 crisis by comparing it with the financial crisis of 2008. And um, we will ask the question, what can we learn from the similarities and differences between these two world-shaking events? Um, you can lecture 
uh, you can register for this lecture online on our website. So now I just uh, want to say thank you again to everybody. <laughs> and um, yeah, and hopefully we will see each other tomorrow. Bye. Thank you.